Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Will you please remain standing for the invocation which will be offered by Rabbi Gilbert Collin of the Pasadena Jewish Temple and Center. O oh Lord, what are we human beings that you should consider us, or the offspring of mere mortals that you should take them into account? And yet you have made us only little less than God and crowned us with substance and with glory. The Bible tells us that we were made in the image of God, and yet the Bible also tells us that God has no physical form that may be duplicated. Perhaps the image of God reflected in our presence in the universe is the tripartite gift of the capacity for intelligent action which we alone share with God. For you and we have been blessed with dexterous fingers that we might construct ever more complex and capable mechanical devices. You have secondly blessed us with perceptive minds that we might create images of things not yet done and transform these images into formulae, equations, and blueprints. And finally, you have blessed us with the power of speech that we might communicate with each other and engage in cooperative endeavors beyond the capacity of any individual or even of all of the individuals of a given generation. For we have access to the past, influence over the present, and our reach extends far into the future. For what we do now will be a significant part of your universe in the years ahead. We pray that you will move our spirits and our consciences in such a way that we will use these gifts in a manner consistent with your hopes and your purposes. May we justify the trust that you have placed in us. Help us by the infusion of your spirit and by the sharing of your vision to be creative and responsible custodians of the garden that you have entrusted to our care. May your world be a better place for our having been within it. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Be seated. Please be seated. Thank you. Rabbi Collin. <clears throat> I am Reuben Mettler, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the California Institute of Technology, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to Caltech's 96th Annual Commencement Ceremony. We are, of course, here to celebrate the graduates, for the spotlight is on them today but many others in the audience also deserve to be honored. That is all of you who have nurtured, encouraged, advised, and financed these young men and women on their way to the platform. Parents, grandparents, husbands and wives, other relatives and friends, and the faculty, staff, trustees, and administrators who have guided, assisted, and taught. You all share in the pride and the pleasure of this occasion and again, welcome to you all. At commencement, we also, to some extent, celebrate Caltech itself, its history and its future. This is especially significant now as the Institute approaches its centennial year, 1991. In anticipation of the centennial, I would like to tell you something of the first 100 years. But 1991 will be full of celebrations, so perhaps the history should be saved for those events. I will tell you one thing about the centennial, however. Look for the Caltech float in the Tournament of Roses parade on January the 1st. That in itself will be a historic event. The centennial float has already been designed and some of the intricate engineering is in progress. I think it'll be spectacular. While skipping the other 99 years, I do wish to note a few highlights 
of this past year. The Caltech freshman class has a record number of women, up from 17% to 31% of the class. In October, the Beckman Institute was dedicated. It's this handsome building right over here to your left. Three Caltech faculty members received the National Medal of Science from President Bush. A Caltech emeritus faculty member headed the governor's inquiry into the collapse of the Nimitz Freeway during the San Francisco earthquake. The Voyager spacecraft completed its spectacular 12-year exploration of the outer planets with a flawless flyby of Uranus. The campus had its first Martin Luther King Day, and last month a talk by Most Reverend Desmond Tutu. A South Africa drew a crowd, drew a crowd of 2,000 of people to the campus. The Hubble telescope was launched into orbit, carrying into space the work and the wisdom of a number of Caltech and JPL people. And the new Keck telescope on Mauna Kea and Hawaii the world's largest, is nearing first light. Also during the past year, Caltech researchers developed a novel process that may be a key step towards curing multiple sclerosis. Another research team came up with a series of new discoveries that should lead to pharmaceuticals with fewer side effects. And still others here design an extremely sophisticated, flexible neural network computer chip. Not to be outdone, a Caltech sophomore worked out a superior analytical system for evaluating major league baseball relief pitchers and attracted the attention of the major league owners, I might say. And another undergraduate discovered a supernova in the constellation Leo, 137 million light years from Earth. Astronomers at Palomar Observatory discovered the most distant object yet found in the universe, seen through Ursa Major just below the Big Dipper. But now let's go back to the future, the future of our graduates, and to someone who's going to bid them Godspeed. I refer to our distinguished commencement speaker, Frank Rhodes, president of Cornell University. This will not be President Rhodes' first time on this platform. In 1988, he presented greetings from America's universities and research institutes to Caltech's President Everhart on the occasion of Tom's inauguration. Frank Rhodes has been president of Cornell since 1977. Before taking that point, that post, he was vice president for academic affairs at the University of Michigan, where he had been dean of the College of Literature, Science, and Arts since 1971. Dr. Rhodes was born in England and received both his undergraduate and graduate degrees from the University of Birmingham. He first came to the United States as a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Illinois. That was from 1950 to 52. He was on the geology faculties of Illinois, the University of Durham, University of Wales, where he was head of the geology department and the dean of the faculty. He's been active for many years in a wide range of public service activities and currently serves on President Bush's Education Policy Advisory Committee. And judging from the title of his talk, Percy's Paradox, it is apparent that he has taken time to read great novels and to philosophize on the meaning of life. We're delighted to welcome to this platform Dr. Frank Rhodes. Mr. Chairman, President Everhart, members of the Board of Trustees, members of the faculty and staff, honored guests, family and friends of today's graduates, and most of all, members of the class of 1990 and candidates for advanced degrees, whose special day this is. This is a great day for all of us as we celebrate your successful completion of the requirements for a Caltech degree. It's been said that the problem with doing it right the first time is that no one will appreciate how difficult it really was. And we're delighted that having done it right the first time, we also have some sense of how difficult it really was. A C at Caltech means that you're just an average, brilliant Caltech experience and student. 
and we affirm today that your success is one and all. From your first days here at Caltech, you've learned from your fellow students as well as faculty members, and you've both gained from and contributed to the life of this campus, teaming up with faculty members on everything from research projects to campus musicals and various sporting events. Teaming up with fellow students, I'm told, to work on problems that are deliberately made too difficult for any one individual to solve alone. Learning science from doing science and learning it not only from each other, but from some of the world's masters in their respective fields. And always living by that distinctive honor code which is the hallmark of Caltech. All these things have combined to make the education you've received at Caltech distinctive and special. Of course, it's also possible to receive distinctive and special education in science and technology at other institutions, of which I like to think my own is one. I must confess that each year when the various scientific honors and achievements are announced, I'm tempted to point to Caltech in reminding my own faculty of what might be possible. You know Anna Tracy's comment when she was speaking to her London publisher and pointed out the much more handsome edition of one of her books, which had just been published in New York. And she said quite simply and directly, as the cock said to the hens when he showed them the ostrich egg, I'm not criticizing, I'm not disparaging, I merely bring to your attention what is being done elsewhere. <laughs> and at Cornell, I like to bring to the attention what is being done at Caltech. You are consistently near the top in every measure that has been devised of achievement in science and technology. And you graduates today are the beneficiaries and the products of that distinctive education. And all of us here in the audience congratulate you and salute you. But you're not alone in your achievements. So many others, as, as Chairman Mettler pointed out, have contributed to today's success. And no one more than the parents and families who are here in the audience today. It's been said that the only time a child is as good as gold to parents is on April 15th. But we all know that there's much more to it than that. Your parents, your spouses, your families have been behind you in so many ways, not just with tuition checks, but with care packages and words of encouragement at tough times. And today we want to speak for all the graduates in saying to members of our families how much we appreciate your steadfast support. We're proud of you and we're grateful. I realize that I'm the final obstacle standing between you and the receipt of your degrees. That's the only reason for having the commencement speech before the award of degrees, I should add. Some commencement speeches are known for their brevity. Bob Hope on one occasion said, for those of you who are going out into the world and want my advice, here it is. Don't go. <laughs> and some are, are notable for their realism. Prince Philip on one occasion said it is traditional for commencement speakers to give you good advice. And it is equally traditional for you as graduates to ignore it. And some commencement speeches, alas, are known for their length. On one relatively recent occasion at Yale, the commencement speaker announced that he was taking the word Yale as the basis for his talk. Y stands for youth, he said, and spoke for 10 minutes about youth. A stands for achievement, and another 15 minutes followed on achievement. And L stands for loyalty, and one quarter of an hour was devoted to loyalty. And finally, E stands for enthusiasm and enthusiasm occupied a full 20 minutes. And finally, at the end of that endurance, one patient member of the audience was heard to declare, thank heavens he's not speaking at the California Institute of Technology. <laughs> <laughs> of course, university presidents recognize hazards of that kind because we've sat through more commencement addresses than most, and that makes us something of a safe bet. Adlai Stevenson once said, it's my job as speaker to talk, it's your job as an audience to listen. If you get through before I do, feel perfectly free to leave. <laughs> but this is not just any commencement. 
It is your commencement. And this is not just any commencement season. It is the year 1990. Not simply the start of a new decade, significant as that is, not simply the eve of your centennial celebrations here at Caltech, notable as that is, not even a mere 10 years away from the start of a new century in which you will spend most of your professional lives, but a time of unparalleled change taking place at an unprecedented speed. You are graduating today literally in a different world from the one into which you step foot as freshmen and beginning graduate students. And I speak not of the scientific and technological change, dramatic as that is, where all of you could speak more knowledgeably than I can, but of changes which have overtaken the world's political systems in which each of us are both participants and observers. Not since the late 18th century has the ideal of freedom carried such sweeping force in world affairs. The communist system is in collapse throughout the world. Even within the Soviet Union, Lithuanians and Estonians and Latvians and separatist groups in other areas, Georgia and the Ukraine, are seeking greater independence from Mother Russia. And the pace of reform is accelerating. There are renewed stirrings of democracy in South America and Central America. In South Africa, long a bastion of white supremacy and black suppression, there are the first hopeful encouraging signs that apartheid may soon be dismantled. And even in China, where a year ago the first stirrings of freedom were crushed with such brutality, there is hope that liberalizing reforms will ultimately continue and prevail. And indeed, it cannot be otherwise in the longer term because the taste of freedom has energized the world. A new generation of leaders has been born in a complex and often brutal world. What these men and women have shown is that change is possible even after years of suppression and adversity. The change can be affected by individuals of courage and commitment, of vision and of will. And the significance of today's commencement is that you join their ranks today. Although most of your careers will be in scientific and technical fields, you emerge also as the world's new leaders. Of course, there's no guarantee that you will automatically emerge as leaders. For here you sit, capped and gowned, formidably equipped, superbly educated, meticulously compared. Bachelors, masters, doctors, biologists, astronomers, chemists, physicists, mathematicians, social scientists, computer scientists, and engineers of every conceivable kind, consummate professionals all. And at this moment of graduation, in the midst of this celebration of your achievement, in the middle of the ceremony of commencement, you face Percy's paradox. Let me explain what I mean by Percy's paradox. Walker Percy, the novelist of the New South, so-called, who died just last month, had as one of his favorite themes the dislocation of humanity in the modern age. And one of his novels, one called The Second Coming, that I read last summer, tells a touching story of a young girl who runs away from a mental institution and of her encounter with a 60-something-year-old man on the verge of suicide and the touching friendship that develops between them as each somehow meets the other's needs. And early in the book, just as the girl is making her first <coughs> tentative venture back into the world, she notices as she walks along the street the way people on a crowded sidewalk veer slightly to the right or to the left in order to avoid bumping into one another. And she realizes that this is a trick, an exchange of signals that suddenly emerging into a world from which she'd been separated for so long, she must learn again. And then Percy writes, suddenly she remembered that she had once been an A student. But what if she flunked ordinary living? That, to me, is Percy's paradox. Can that really be? Can you really be a straight-A student at Caltech 
and still flunk life? How can it possibly be, you ask? Let me suggest that flunking life is failure to recognize that to whom much is given, much is also required. That flunking life is to ignore the link between professional practice and personal commitment. That flunking life is to deny that the diploma you will receive today gives you an obligation not only to lead, but also to serve. Getting A's in life, as opposed to getting them in college, has at its heart not simply catchy slogans, but commitment reinforced by conviction, faithfully and persistently held, because those two things, commitment and conviction, are the private face of public leadership. They are the things which are changing the world in which we live. Commitment to anything beyond one's own immediate needs was anathema just a few years ago when much of daily life was centered on avoiding commitments of any kind. Even marriage and family life were avoided because they were potentially constraining. It was a simpler life in some ways, but ultimately one that was unfulfilling. For the truth is that it is our very commitments that give meaning and purpose to life. And if the yuppies of the 80s have taught us anything, it is that life without commitment is superficial and unsatisfying. That a triumphant career, that technical success are not enough. That hollow men and women and moral nomads reap not fulfillment, but futility. The closing years of the 80s rediscovered commitment. But if commitment is back in fashion, courageous conviction is not. It's still far easier to equivocate than to stand firm. Lender and Martin, in a recent book, have a marvelous quotation about a congressman who was asked his attitude about alcohol and the federal policy that should relate to it. If you mean, he said, that demon drink that poisons the mind, that pollutes the body, that desecrates family life and inflames sinners, then I am against it. But if you mean the elixir of Christmas cheer, the shield against winter chill, the taxable potion that puts needed funds into public coffers to comfort little crippled children, then I am for it. That is my position and I will not compromise. <laughs> But what these recent political upheavals show, played out every day on the front page of the New York Times and the screens of the nightly news, is that leaders of courage and commitment can change and have changed the world. For in 12 brief months, we have seen the most sweeping social change that our society has ever seen. And although some of its architects were politicians, most were not. They were instead a playwright and a political prisoner, a shipyard worker and a music professor, and the 60-year-old editor of a newspaper. These are people who have scored straight A's in life. And what unites them, it seems to me, is not just commitment, but also the courage of their convictions. That courage may be expressed in countless ways, but are not political. It was that courage in educational needs and progress that led Amos Throop to found this Grace Institution, and George Ellery Hale and Arthur Noyes and Robert Millikan to establish it on that foundation. You see it amongst members of your own faculty and the Board of Trustees, people like Robert McNamara, Caltech Life Trustee, who going from a magnificent successful career in industry went on to a position in government and on in turn to a position as President in the World Bank, spurring development throughout the world. You see it in Arnold Beckman, former faculty member and trustee as well as alumnus, also a life trustee and chairman of the board emeritus, once professor of chemistry here who went on from there to build one of the world's great scientific and medical instrument companies and who has given so much back to this institution in both material terms and devoted leadership. And you see it in so many others represented on the board and the faculty, in Thomas Watson, Jr., in Shirley Hufstedler, in Rube Mettler, in Tom Everhart, in so many others, people who scored straight A's in life. The same kind of courage and commitment 
can mark intellectual stances. Einstein was once told that 100 Nazi professors had denounced as wrong his theory of relativity. If I were wrong, Einstein mused, if I were wrong, one professor would have been enough. And it can be the commitment of a doctor to a patient or a professor to a pupil or an engineer to a design team or a business executive to someone on the shop floor or of neighbor to neighbor or of parent to child or of son and daughter to elderly parent. Each of those can reflect the same kind of grounded concern for human dignity and individual freedom. Oliver Wendell Holmes once declared, every calling is great when greatly pursued. And as you begin your new calling today, whether in graduate or professional school or in a new career, that is the calling, that is the life that we wish for you. A great calling, greatly pursued. To gloss over that is to flunk life, however many degrees you may accumulate. That is Percy's paradox. By refusing to recognize both the burdens and the consequences of today's graduation is to flunk life not just in the great destinies of nations, but in the humdrum events of each day's round. For the testimony of the men and women who have preceded you through the noble 99 years of the history of this great institution is that life itself is also a paradox, that it is by losing ourselves in larger causes that we find ourselves, that it is by giving that we receive it is by squandering our lives away for worthwhile purposes that ultimately we free ourselves. It is by committing ourselves to others that we find fulfillment. It is by serving that we lead. And if those truths have an ancient ring, that is no accident, for they represent the accumulated experience of those who went before us and gave us not just this knowledge, but also this opportunity today. On this commencement morning, that is the crystallized wisdom of the ages, and guided by those truths, all things are yours. But without those truths, professional success will prove empty, and life's prizes will crumble in your grasp. Albert Schweitzer once said on a similar occasion, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know. The only ones among you who will find true happiness are those who have sought and have found how to serve. And that is why today's ceremony is a matter of moment. For it certifies not just your professional competency, praiseworthy as that is, not simply the end of a long formal apprenticeship, noteworthy, as that is, but rather your emergence with all your energy and boldness and dreams and professional skills as our newest leaders, committed to those ancient verities demonstrated afresh from Beijing to Berlin, from Cape Town to Warsaw, from Managua to Prague, rekindling as you graduate today the hopes of humankind that your leadership is now a part of that great ongoing process. That is cause for celebration. That is reason for hope. There's an old Gaelic blessing that seems to me to summarize all that is best in the relationship between the alma mater and her sons and daughters. May the sun shine gently on your face. May the wind be at your back. May the road rise to meet you. And may God hold you in the hollow of his hand until we meet again. Men and women of Caltech, congratulations, good success, Godspeed.
Thank you, Mrs. Hubbard and members of the Caltech Glee Clubs. And thank you, Dr. Rhodes, for that stirring and very relevant set of remarks. We appreciate your sharing your insight and your challenges <coughs> with us. Time now for the conferring of degrees, which will be done by President uh, Everhart. Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben. Candidates for the degree of Bachelor of Science. Mr. President, I present these candidates who have fulfilled all requirements for the degree of Bachelor of Science. In addition, I present those in absentia whose names appearing in the program will not be read. Thank you, Dean Brennan. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the California Institute of Technology, I confer upon you the degree Bachelor of Science and admit you to all its rights and privileges. Saeed Zubair Ahmad. Paul V. Amadeo. Kenneth Skilling Andrews. Arthur Ang Jr. Demetrius Antsos. Manuel Aranda Jr. Saeed Amir Azam. Mohammed Azim. Stephen Philip Bard. Randall Lewis Barron. Dwight Eugene Berg. Rick D. Berg. Christopher Bertani. Sandeep Biswal. Brian Andrew Brandt. Timothy T. Broberg. Herbert John Burroughs. Robert Stevens Byers, Jr. Kleber Alberto Camacho. Hui Tan Kao. David Richard Carta. Kevin Charles Case. Andrew W. Chen. John C. C. Chen. Benjamin G. M. Chu. Amy Lira Pradeep Choksi. Vivian Chow. Dolly Chu. Stephen Glenn Kleiner. Robert Francis Coker. William P. Cross. Kevin Richard Curtis. Joseph William Daydeck. John Thomas Daly. Christopher David Edgington. David Allen Edwards. Glenn Charles Eichner. Oh. 
Drazen Fabri. George Fang. Xiao Che Fung. Carver Clark Farrow, Jr. Jimmy Eng Fenders. Philip John Fernandez. Mark Philip Fay. Pamela Yuk Ching Fong. Robert Allen Fox. Charles Chin Win Fu. Eric Thomas Fung. Benjamin Allen Funk. Christina Lynn Garden. Paul Richard Jontou. Matthew Lee Geiger. Alexander Gilman. Alan Frederick Golightly. Robert A. Groth, Jr. Kin Ha. John Hampkins. Kirk Hargreaves. Gregory Michael Harry. Eric Dent Hassenzahl. Gerald Von Hauk. Mark Harold Howes. Amanda Ayers Heaton. Lee Wen Hao. Colin Douglas Howell. Christopher David Hurwitz. James Paul Ibbotson. Tariq Isani. Manish Jain. Adam L. Janin. Anders Robert Johnson. Sean Leonard Johnston. Michael Christopher Jones. Jason Joseph Karseski. Matthew John Kidd. Nikolaos Kidonakis. Jung Duk Kim. Clifton Jared Kaiser. Kathleen Elizabeth Kramer. David Wayne LaFollette. Amit Lau. Brendan Michael LaSalle. Alvin Wayin Law. Angela Tsailing Lee. Howard Shu Kwong Lee. Ming Lee. Thomas James Lonowski. Po King Lee. Elaine Emily Lindeleff. George Yenshi Liu. 
David Ray Lomax. Kate Elizabeth Loomis. Jennifer Ann Lowe. Stephen J. Ludke. Alan David Lund. Mark Tien Sing Ma. Robert William Maher. Frederick Carl Mallon. Charlotte Faith Marico Manley. Ron Arthur Markey. Aris Mustakis. Bushan Mudbari. Asim Mughal. Robert L. Myers. Edward J. Nanali. Johnny Ng. Viola G. Ng. Tui Thimin Win. Kent Brian Nordstrom. Joel Norris. Martin Joseph O'Brien. Christopher Wee. Andre Garapat Ohanisian. Satomi Okasaki. Stephen Olofsson. Lawrence Dean Oliver. Richard Joseph Oliver. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Jeffrey Mark Pilling. Margalita Mia Pollock. Kevin John Pond. Anise Marie Porter. Aditya Prakash. Gordon Douglas Prioreski. David Walter Proctor. Faris Hababur Rahman. Gregory Randall Ralph. Chandra Shekhar Rahman. Edward Ratner. Richard Robert Reed. Scott Norman Richmond. David William Risher. Frederick Gurney Rober. Theodore William Rogers. Stephen J. Rosenberg. Michael Philip Salisbury. Marcus Alex Santoso. Zulfikar Saeed. Douglas Eric Schaefer. Derek Vaughn Sly. Michael Morris Smith. Craig Anthony Sosin. 
Samuel Nathan Southard, Jr. Mira Srinivasan. David M. Stevens. Besu Swen. Blake Thomas Sullivan. Catherine Elise Swift. James Donald Taylor. Ross Tenyek. Glenn Paul Tesler. Milton Evan Tinkoff. Leopold E. Travis. Thomas Joseph Tromey. Chandra Lenore Tucker. Mark Lewis Turner. Kevin Henry Van Bledel. Adam Joby Weissman. John Edward Werner. Kenneth Bruce Wheeler. Patricia Katrine Weiss. Robert Sylvester Williamson III. Scott Andrew Wolfe. Douglas Mantat Wong. Chi Ching Wong. Jeanette Wu. David Webster Wood. Xiao Jing Yan. Ji Meng Yang. Richard Ye. <coughs> Peter Ying. Harold Robert Zatz. Arthur Joseph Zerger. Candidates for the degree of Master of Science. Mr. President, I present these candidates who have fulfilled all requirements for the degree of Master of Science. In addition, I present those in absentia whose names appearing in the program will not be read. Thank you, Vice President Lorden. By the, authority, by the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the California Institute of Technology, I confer upon you the degree Master of Science and admit you to all its rights and privileges. Yoshio Abe. <laughs> Salim Ahmed. Dwight Eugene Berg. Paul Anthony Bonenfant. Olga Boric. Daniel Francis Bourget. Frederick Wonyo. Bedri Cha Chaitin. Sonali Chakrabarti. Ajay Janthana. 
Fun Chun. Vivian Chow. Consolver? Yes. James Alden Consolver. John Anthony Cortez. Eric Bryant Cummings. Roderick Theodore Dublin. Michael Bruce Danielle. Hervé DeMarla. Michael Anthony Dominic. Paul Richard Dressel. Aaron David Early. David J. Edelson. Christopher James Elkins. Lars Yakov Folia. Nico George Glumak. Stephen Craig Gortzema. Lisa Ba Grant. Jeffrey Paul Grundvig. Martin Werner Grunewald. <laughs> Jonathan Bruce Hacker. Louis Emmanuel Halperin. Karen Ann Harvey. Mohammed Amir Hussein. Matthew E. Johnson. Is it Jungers? Jungers. Patricia Diane Jungers. Eratokritos Charalambus Katsubunidis. <laughs> David Andrew Kaufman. <laughs> Donald William Kendrick. <laughs> David Blair Kirk. Adam Kolodny. Ronald C. Kong. <laughs> Axel Wolf Hendrick Kratel. <laughs> Scott David Krentzman. <laughs> Sophia Kieriatsopoulou. <laughs> Bob Kwokshing Lee. Fu Suin Lee. Karen Andrea Lee. Stephen Sylvain Leroy. Wing Su Agnes Lung. I know. Yu Chun Donald Lee. Wen Su. Leo. Victor Manuel Lubecki. Yvonne de Sousa Maciel. Sunil Kumar Malhotra. Michael Irving Mandel. Ubin Mao. Joseph Carl Matesic, Jr. <coughs> Raymond George Mayer. Rom Gareth McGuffin. James Franklin Miller III. Anton Mark Monk. John Christopher Morris. John Murphy. Gopalakrishnan Narayanan. Is it Jordan? Frederick Jorgen Nordby III. 
Takao Omata. Sung Kwang Orr. John Thomas Orchard. Gabriel Fernande de Bobadilla Osorio. Joel Alexander Peterson. In Satish Pillai. Vicky Lynn Pipel. Yong Chow. David William Risher. Susan Elizabeth Roden. Carl Joseph Rubenacher. Majid Sagafi. Masahiro Sayano. Joel Mark Schwartz. Ali Shakuri. Angela Chaoshuin Shi. William Condon Shoemaker. Sharon Marie Schustrom. William Russell Softkey. Anand Keshov Soman. Mark Leonard Tillman. George Timothy Tomayich. Charles Suchung Tsai. Wayne Wensui Tso. Kevin Eugene Underhill. Marcel Rene Fandergoot. Hoing Wong. C. Wong. Andrew Bennett Wells. Huafon Wen. Gregory Thomas Willett. Mao Chong Wung. Chi Ming Yang. <laughs> Candidates for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Mr. President, for not fewer than three years of graduate residence, these candidates have undertaken advanced studies and independent original investigations. These candidates, by passing a final oral exam and presenting the results of their research in a thesis, have satisfied the faculty that they have met all the requirements of the doctorate at the California Institute of Technology. Mr. President, I present these candidates and those in absentia whose names appear in the program but will not be read for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Thank you very much, Dean Albee. You have completed the highest degree awarded by the California Institute of Technology. Therefore, by the authorities vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I convey upon I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and admit you to all its rights and privileges. I commend you on your high accomplishments and welcome you to the company of scholars. For the Division of Biology, Dr. Owen. Lois Margaret Banta. Congratulations, Lois. <laughs> <laughs> K. 
Kurt Andrew Brarson. Congratulations. Kurt. <laughs> George John Carmen. Lance Force. Paul R. Miller. Congratulations. I'll see you shortly. Frank Pregshot. Hi. Got a friend. Joanne Topo. For the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, Dr. Anson. Douglas D. Axe. Claudia Jane Barner. Let's go. Enrique Jeffroy Aguilar. Paul Raymond Goodrich, Jr. Congratulations. Christopher J. Guski. Let's go. James Edward Hansen. W. Reef Hardy. Erica Lynn Harvey. Let's go ahead. Welcome back. <laughs> Chaitan Kosla. <laughs> Elena M. McLoof. Congratulations. <laughs> Hi, buddy. <laughs> Charles Buddy Mullins. Nice going. Ricky Chuyen Ng. Hung Viet Nguyen. Congratulations. Stephen Lewis Novak. Nice going. Hi, David. David Haynes Sims. Nice going. <coughs> Anthony Skellum. Nice going. Young Kui Sun. Nice going. Robert J. Sweeney. Nice going. Oh. 
Ernest Byron Wysong. Nice going. Fang Dong Yin. Thomas Edward Zewart. Nice going. For the Division of Engineering and Applied Science, Dr. Seinfeld. Marie Agnes Allard. Gary John Ballas. Roberto Alfredo Camasa. <laughs> Stephen Lewis Cicio. Yeah, I know. Howard Ziwa Chen. Kiat Chua. <laughs> Xiaoming Den. <laughs> Thomas Frank Frick. David Benjamin Goldstein. <laughs> Catherine Kent Hayes. <laughs> Ji Kwang Ho. Kayo Ide. <laughs> Craig C. Jonkey. <laughs> Deventhra Cholera. Gregor Kovacic. <laughs> Marie Bernard P. Levine. Vincent Cheng Tae Liu. Giancarlo Umberto Maria Lazzi. Robert Ian McLaughlin. Kit Yin Ng.
Shole Nikzad. Chiol Hoon Park. <laughs> Francois Pepin. <laughs> Nabil Aga Riza. Koichi Sayano. <laughs> Rachel E. Shin Mendoza. <laughs> Kumar N. Shivarajan. Gregory Todd Smedley. Roy S. R. Smith. Thank you. Wen King Sue. Kun Tan <laughs> Michelle Shouting Teng <laughs> Huang Swan Vu. Harold Aaron Zerum. <laughs> Mai Zhuang. <laughs> George Allen Zimmerman. For the Division of Geological and Planetary Sciences, Dr. Stevenson. William Wyatt Anderson. <laughs> Allison Lynn Bent. Joel David Bloom. Congratulations, Joel. John Hugh Davis. <laughs> Wei Liu. Gregory Hale Miller. Congratulations, Greg. Oh, 
Robert Lowell Ripperdon. Huawei Zhu. We do have one. Here. For the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences, Dr. Grether. Guofu Tan. <laughs> <laughs> For the Division of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy, Dr. Neugebauer. Mark Adler. <laughs> Great. A wild crew out here. <laughs> Danielle Ashlock. <laughs> Kent Budge. Great. <laughs> Blaze Kanzian. Very good. Thank you. It's an honor, sir. Carlo. Oh, oh wait a minute. Are supposed to take this off? <laughs> Carlo Carrero. I hope I got that right. Here we go. Chi Bin Xian. Did I get that one? All right, here we go. Put it and keep it up there. Don DeYoung. Thank you. Thank you. Olivier Espinoza. Congratulations. Claire Gu. Arun Gupta. Great. Michael Hoink. Congratulations. <laughs> David Imel. George Kafkulis. Zhao Ping Li. Congratulations. Stephen Myers. Congratulations. Martin Savage. Congratulations. Charles Stidell. I was going to say Chuck. <laughs> Sandeep Trivedi. Do you win out a call? Christine Wilson. Congratulations.
On behalf of the faculty and the trustees, I offer you my congratulations to each of you that has just graduated. You've successfully completed a significant step in your education at an institution which does not take such achievements lightly. I'm delighted to report that there are now 192 new bachelors of science, 157 new masters of science, and 148 new doctors of philosophy. Total number of degrees of 497, increasing the roles of our alumni by nearly that number. I would like to call to your attention the names highlighted with asterisks among the bachelor degree recipients. These students have been graduated with honors. Honor standing at Caltech is awarded by a vote of the faculty to those students who have achieved at an exceptionally high level of performance in their undergraduate work, usually indicating an average grade better than B+. This year, this honor has been won by 87 seniors out of a graduating class of 192, or 45 percent. We commend you on this achievement. On the final pages of your program, you'll find an impressive listing of awards which have been bestowed upon our students. The current winners of each award are given along with the names of past recipients who are graduating this year. Upon reading through this list, you will discover why we are so proud of our students. They are, indeed, a remarkable group. Although we do not have the time to do so on this occasion, each of these awardees is deserving of special congratulations, and they have been honored at individual ceremonies held during the course of the last few weeks. I do have the great pleasure, however, of naming three special awards this morning. The first is the Mabel Beckman Prize. This award was established by Caltech to honor Mabel Beckman, who supported Caltech as a friend and benefactor for over 50 years. The prize bearing Mrs. Beckman's name is awarded annually to a woman student upon completion of her junior or senior year in recognition of demonstrated academic and personal excellence, contributions to the Institute community, and outstanding qualities of character and leadership. The, window, the winner this year is Golda Bernstein. <laughs> Golda is a junior in applied mathematics who has made significant contributions to the Caltech community as an active member of the Caltech Y Student Executive Committee and as chair of the Community Service Committee. In this role, she has concentrated her efforts in involving the Caltech students in volunteer activities in the local public schools. As a fine example to others, Golda herself has volunteered one day a week the past two years, presenting science projects and tutoring children, including the hearing impaired who benefit from her ability to sign. As leader in the physics club, Golda was co-organizer of the high school field day, an event which had nearly 100 students participating in a fun-filled education day this spring. Golda is known as a committed, compassionate person with a generous nature. She knows how to gain the support of others and to follow through on her ideas. Caltech is lucky that we will have this outstanding woman student on campus for one more year. Golda had breakfast with Dr. Beckman this morning and was delighted at the chance to meet him due to a misunderstanding. She's unable to be with us today, but I will see to it that a certificate and check in recognition of this honor are given to her. I now have the pleasure of presenting the Heinrichs Memorial Award. Established by the Board of Trustees, this award is given in memory of Frederick W. Heinrichs, Jr., who served for more than 20 years as a dean and professor at the Institute. In remembrance of his honor, courage, and kindness, the award bearing his name is made annually to the senior who's made the greatest contribution to the student body throughout his or her undergraduate years at the Institute, and whose qualities of character, leadership, and responsibility have been outstanding. The winner this year is Gerald von Hoek. In 
In his soft-spoken and unassuming way, Jerry Huck has been an exceptionally effective and widely respected student leader throughout his years at Caltech. Jerry served the entire campus community, first as a member, then secretary, and finally as chairman of the Board of Control, the board that oversees our honor system. Chairing this committee is a very difficult job, and Jerry did it superbly. The hallmarks of his chairmanship were fairness, painstaking thoroughness, and a special focus on preventive, ed preventive education. In his dual role as vice president of the associate students, Associated Students, Jerry helped to guide the board of directors in a positive and constructive manner, assisting frequently with problematic situations. As a model of character and integrity, Jerry has been an inspiration to many other Caltech students. He has had a very significant influence on others, providing encouragement and wisdom for those who frequently turn to him for advice. Jerry's maturity, energy, and solid work ethic, combined with outstanding interpersonal and communication skills, make him an extraordinary valuable and deeply influential member of the Caltech community. As he graduates, we're delighted to recognize his significant contributions with the 1990 Heinrichs Award. Jerry, great to you. The final award to be made today is the Milton and Francis Clauser Doctoral Prize. This prize is awarded annually from a gift of the Clauser family in recognition of Milton and Francis Clauser, twin alumni of the Institute. The Clauser Prize is awarded to a student whose PhD thesis completed within the previous 12 months reflects extraordinary standards of quality, innovative research, ingenuity, and especially the potential of opening new avenues of human thought and endeavor. This year, the Clauser Award has been given to Dr. Chaitan Koshla for his thesis in chemical engineering. <laughs> Chaitan's thesis is entitled Vitreocillo Hemoglobin Gene Structure and Regulation Function and Applications to Aerobic Bioprocesses. During his PhD research, Dr. Koslet developed an extremely original solution to a classic engineering problem. Many products and processes vital to our health and environment, ranging from new drugs and biotechnology to biological degradation of waste, utilize cells which require oxygen. Over the previous 45 years, chemical engineers first invented and have continued to improve the methodology for supplying oxygen to these critical processes. All of this prior work involved delivering oxygen from the air to the outer surface of the cells. Chaitan's research, however, breaks entirely new ground by focusing within the cell to improve the effectiveness of the cell's function in low oxygen environments. This concept was specially implemented in Dr. Kosla's thesis by transferring to an industrial important microbe the gene for a novel hemoglobin found in a bacterium which lives in muddy, oxygen-starved conditions. Cells endowed with the ability to synthesize hemoglobin also synthesize proteins more efficiently than unmodified cells under poorly oxygenated conditions. Dr. Kosla also studied the mechanisms of this efficiency enhancement and of gene regulation under microaerobic conditions. Chaitan's ideas and discoveries have the potential to impact in a major way areas ranging from the manufacture of pharmaceuticals and foods to mining and bioremediation. I would like to ask him to step over here. I'd like to tell you he's just come back from a postdoctoral work in England for today's ceremony. And I'd like to present him with a check in recognition of this outstanding work.
I'm the only thing standing between you and the end of this ceremony, so I'll try to be brief. <laughs> Last week, the first picture of our planetary system ever taken, looking back from outside it, was made public by Professor Ed Stone of Caltech. Professor Carl Sagan of Cornell pointed to a dot in the picture and exclaimed and exclaimed that that insignificant dot in the vastness of space was where we live, the planet Earth. President Rhodes has just reminded us that we on planet Earth live in times of great change, socially as well as technologically. Archbishop Desmond Tutu told us recently that the peoples of the world who do not live in freedom are striving for it. In January of this year, we had the opportunity to hear President John Slaughter of Occidental College remind us that equality of opportunity remains an often elusive goal in our own country. Although Caltech focuses on science and engineering, and you graduates are well prepared technically, your education has not neglected the human spirit, nor interactions of humans individually or collectively. To the humanities and the social sciences, you have learned basic principles and different ways of thought that will be important in these turbulent social times. And most importantly, you have lived under the honor code. You have been trusted and you have been challenged. Challenged to understand just what the honor code means and just what actions are appropriate if you are to meet the trust placed in you by your fellow students, the faculty, and the rest of the Caltech community. Living the honor code has prepared you for life in vitally important ways. Life here has brought laughter and sorrow. Who of you could restrain a chuckle as you viewed a motorbike tied to a wall 30 feet in the air after ditch day? Evidently, the reward for solving the stack was not deemed sufficient. Some of you may have helped unfurl a banner from the top of Millican Library that said simply, we love you, Dick. That expressed the mood of the entire Caltech community as we mourn the passing of Professor Richard Feynman. One of your student colleagues has been named in Time Magazine's top 20 college students during each of the last three competitions, and we understand for the next year as well. The Caltech bridge team started a year or so ago, placed second in the nation, and the chess team is going to the finals. Students from Caltech have won the ACM computer programming contest two out of the last three years, as well as the one sponsored by Apple Computer. But to students, Caltech is more than winning prizes. It is helping a colleague solve a problem. It is pranks. It is learning about science and technology and people. It is learning both substance and process. It is preparation for life. There are challenges and opportunities awaiting you. You read about them daily in the newspaper. The environment on that speck that Professor Sagan pointed out is changing. Our consciousness is being raised about waste, about CFCs, about other greenhouse gases. You are conscious that the resources of the world are being depleted. Our nation's crude oil production peaked about the time many of you were born and has been decreasing since. Now this country imports about $50 billion worth of petroleum every year, for which, which, which we must pay in goods, in services, or in property. As a nation, we have not been in earning enough by selling goods and services, so we have been selling off our property. At the rate the world is currently using petroleum, we will run out in about 50 years. Long before that, during your lifetime, energy disruption may occur unless we plan for alternative sources soon. Some of you may devise successful alternatives to this energy problem. Many such opportunities abound to challenge you. Most of these challenges will be solved by adapting science and technology to the basic human needs of food, shelter, mobility, information transfer, knowledge generation, and so on. However, we shall have to treat the world as a system and understand far better than we do now how it can produce and what it can absorb 
and still be fit for human life. With your knowledge and abilities, you are an important part of the solution to these important worldwide problems. Problems that couple science and technology to the well-being of human society. 85 years ago, speaking in an outside commencement somewhat larger than this one, Benjamin Ide Wheeler asked a graduating class at the University of California, Berkeley, you have one life to use, how can you make it count for the most and for the best? He went on to say that there is no standard recipe, that each person must find the answer for themselves. And then he advised, effective living is largely a matter of will. What each of you is to be in life will depend on chiefly on what you will to be. During the rest of his talk, he amplified that advice, saying, among other things, the life to will is a life of work. At Caltech, you have learned to work. If you didn't know before you got here, you certainly know as you leave. I hope that President Rhodes' eloquence has persuaded you that it is, it is by committing ourselves to others that we find fulfillment, that by serving, we lead. You have had the will to work successfully toward the goal of graduation. You now have the opportunity to work towards longer-term goals that can improve human communication, safety, shelter, and health, human vision and spirit, to say nothing of knowledge or the world environment. As you leave Caltech and your careers progress, may you find the will to work toward these larger goals. May you employ your considerable talents to solve some of the most vexing and some of the most important problems that have ever been encountered by humans traveling through the void on this spaceship we call Earth. On behalf of all of us who remain at Caltech, I offer our very best wishes for all your future endeavors and heartiest congratulations on all your accomplishments here, which we celebrate today. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. We would like to extend an invitation to all of you to visit the Beckman Institute, which is to your left, and which will be open for viewing following the ceremonies. <clears throat> You'll be able to visit the Beckman Room, which contains a number of exhibits of the life and times of Caltech trustee Arnold Beckman, a timeline of chemistry from the 1600s to modern times, and a re recreating of Dr. Beckman's lab at Caltech, and a capsule history of Caltech from 1891 through the 1980s. We will now conclude this convocation. Following the benediction, please wait to greet the graduates until the platform party has marched out, and thank you. Will the audience please stand for the benediction? So now, O oh Lord, it is over. The traditional and special ceremonies have taken place. You've answered our prayers to keep us shaded from the potentially warm sun. The degrees in course and honors have been awarded to their respective recipients. We have heard and hopefully taken to our heart the eloquent and inspiring words of our honored guest, Dr. Rhodes. And so, as we take our leave, let us reflect gratefully upon the difficulties and the rewards of our work and upon the opportunities and challenges which lie ahead. But let us also be grateful for moments of joy and celebration, which are the milestones of our lives. Help us to embrace this life in a spirit of gratitude and enthusiasm, echoing the joyful words of the psalmist. This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be happy in it. May the Lord of all nations watch over you and bless you. May the God of all peoples smile upon you and be kind to you. 
May the source of harmony and unity in the cosmos show you favor and help you show us the way to peace and harmony among all the peoples and nations of the earth. Amen.